Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We on Harvard believe that war, although sometimes necessary, should only be undertaken when absolutely necessary. And that when it's done, it must be done in the most just way possible that limits unnecessary deaths and civilian casualties. As a consequence, we believe that since the motion before this House is that this House believes that the media should show the full horrors of war, that we should run this in the broadest way possible to have the best possible debate on the merits. As a consequence, what we're going to say is that normatively, democratic states should not limit the content that their media show. We want to further clarify our model in three ways. First off, the government should not censor the media from presenting any images that do not have non-strategic value. Let me give you an example of this. When caskets returned to the United States from Afghanistan and Iraq, the Bush administration restricted the media from taking photos of death caskets. There's no strategic reason why this wasn't allowed, and consequently, government shouldn't be allowed to ban these kinds of images. However, Geraldo Rivera, during the invasion of Iraq, drew a map on the sand that showed troop movements. This is acceptable to ban because it doesn't show the horrors of war, but instead conveys the information. Secondly, we would say is that the media should not self-censor from showing images because of their graphic or violent nature. What we'd say here is an example of things like the Daniel Kirby Pearl beheading, where the U.S. media refused to show it because it showed a violent graphic beheading of a Wall Street Journal, Wall Street Journal journalist. And we think that the media, if the media were to show this, we'd understand the risk of journalists and other civilians within the, um, within the conflicts of war. Third, what we'd say is that our model doesn't just contain graphic images, but as well information and documents that have non-strategic value. Let me give you another example based on the American recent conflicts, which is that both the Bush administration and now the Obama administration have been unwilling to release many important documents about our behavior in Guantanamo Bay and also within the conflict of Iraq and Afghanistan. Even though they don't have strategic information within there, because we're afraid that they'll embolden the enemy. But what we're going to tell you is all of these images would be better out if they were in the public marketplace because it would lead to more just wars being fought. As a consequence, I have three constructive arguments I'd like to offer. No, thank you. First, we're going to say that this is going to reduce the rates of non-necessary wars being fought in the future. Secondly, we're going to say that when wars are fought, that they will be more just. And third, I'm going to argue that this will not hamper our ability to fight the necessary conflicts, and that we'll still be able to do so, and we won't lose the result of fighting these situations. First, why is this going to help, our, um, help eliminate the fighting of unnecessary war in the future? No, thank you. First off, we'd say that democracies, as we set our model, function based on informed citizens. However, there's a disconnect between our ability to process analytic facts and our ability to process images and graphic information. This is because when we see an image, we have a graphic and visceral reaction instead of simply an analytic reaction to seeing a big number, like 50,000 dead in Vietnam. The consequence is just one image can create the reaction within citizens that they'll understand what's actually taking place within the theater, and instead change their opinions about the costs of war and be more critical in the future. We think, however, when the images like, like CNN is afraid to show anything too graphic, people don't understand how bloody and violent it really is in Iraq right now, and as a consequence, don't really think critically about how long the United States should stay there or how we should conduct our policies there. No, thank you. As a consequence, we think this is incredibly problematic. However, we'd secondly say this was to help to limit the number of volunteers in the future. Far too often in democratic countries, people just volunteer gung-ho to go off into the war zone or to join the military because they don't know what it's like to be a soldier. They have military recruiters who tell them that they get to be G.I. Joe and jump out of helicopters without them ever seeing the images of what it's actually like to be in a conflict zone. Both their comrades die, but also they will be in situations where there's citizens, literally innocent civilians that are targeted as well and that they'll have to deal with these images. We think that citizens will make more informed decisions about whether or not they want to go to war in the future. As a consequence, if there's lower numbers of volunteers in Western United States, the consequence is going to be huge that they're going to be less likely to go into conflicts willy-nilly. As a consequence, they'll have to think more critically about how to use troops and the most efficient way to expend them. The third argument we make, however, is that under this point is that it emboldens members of the opposition. Right now, in countries like the United States or other members that were part of the coalition, immediately after 9-11, it was very difficult to be critical of the war effort. However, if it was the case of normal citizens were seeing how violent the conflict was in Afghanistan, it would have been easier for opposition parties to step on second and say, maybe we should think really hard about how we're fighting this war and not let the Bush administration spend four years before they get their act together. We think we'd be better off if opposition members can actually put it in this way. Sure. Is not the obvious effect of your model that the families of the three U.S. contractors mutilated and hung from a bridge in Fallujah in 2004 would have their communities last see them hanging from a bridge, mutilated and burned? Sure, I think there would be a lot of pain for those individual families, but the rest of us would share their pain as a consequence would be acting or rational manner. There's no reason for us to change our policies. And we 
has more contractors are coming from bridges on your side of the house, which is exactly what we're trying to do. Finally, however, what we'd say is that academics and journalists will be able to be more critical about the weapons in the future. The second argument, however, I'd like to make is that it leads to more just wars. Now, there's three principles of just war theory. That is, proportionality, necessity, and discretion. We think that by showing images, you actually create sympathy for victims that make it more likely that all three of these principles will be followed. First off, proportionality. Now, Israel's actually been very good about being, being proportionate when they're willing to bomb targets within, the, within Gaza because they know that the Israel, Israeli journalists are very good at showing images of civilian deaths. However, the United States at once killed 247 people trying to kill one al-Qaeda leader, many of them civilians, because they limited journalists' access to photos of this. As a result, Americans weren't so critical of the fact that we were willing to be unproportional in our war on terror. When these images get out there, people stop to say, really, is this one leader worth killing so many innocent people? Secondly, necessity is also wrong. Think about Abu Ghraib, the photos that got out of Abu Ghraib of people doing incredibly okay, unhumane towards prisoners. Once these photos got out, Americans said, why are we doing this to prisoners? We need to investigate this, but it's only after the images come out. Third, we think there's better discretion. We think that actually the, just what discretion means is just the delineating between civilians and non-civilians. But only when you see images of civilians actually being targeted do we have an incentive to tell the military to use more strategic bombs because in modern warfare there's continually incentives for the military to target to afar, which leads to non-discretion. Third, however, we don't think this will hamper our ability to fight conflicts in the future. First off, because countries will actually have to get more international support before they go into conflicts because their citizens won't want them to go into conflicts unnecessarily. We think this leads to more just wars and more better conflicts. Secondly, however, we think that humanitarian images of humanitarian conflicts will actually embolden us to go into these conflicts. After Americans saw movies like Hotel Rwanda, we couldn't believe that we didn't go into the conflict. However, the media at the time self centered the images that they showed of people literally having limbs cut off. The consequences that we were unwilling to go into these situations. Finally, however, we think that these images are the most powerful men in many cases, like the bloody people being targeted in Iran, and will make us think critically about what conflicts are most important. As a consequence, we've tried to set up the broadest possible debate where we can discuss the issues and argue that this will limit unnecessary wars, that this will lead to more just wars, but we'll still be able to fight necessary wars. For all of these reasons, we are very proud to propose. Or even just inflict horror on thousands upon thousands of people. 
people. Secondly, he said we should be able to show those soldiers, as Steve said, being home drawn and quartered. I would ask you a question, sir. What gives you the right to remove my family's ability to mourn my dead? We don't allow you to report on suicide. We don't allow you to report the faces of murdered and raped women in the street just because it might heighten people's ability to abhor rape. When these are things that you protect people from, surely on this basis. Thirdly, his case is mutually contradictory. Firstly, it will cause people to reconsider wars in which they are involved, but also people will not be able to comprehend the information in a rational fashion in order to make proper decisions. Rujal will talk more about screwing up domestic politics in relation to this policy, but the point is that they can't comprehend it properly, they can't come to a proper decision, and no matter how the war is something they want to be involved in. Fourthly, we want people to be able to share their pain. Again, we need justification as to why my pain or my family's pain is a quantifiable by you, and even if you can quantify it, why well, you can squash it for the purpose of what you see as valid. And fifthly, he told us this will help us in relation to discretion, help us in relation to what's going on. And the quote from the opening speaker was, it's fine, we can tell the military what to do. If you really want to screw up the ability of the military to propagate wars in a strategic fashion which limits civilian casualties, allowing their movements to be hamstrung by the whims of a public, but into something which is horrifically harmful and which is bound to screw up more lives than it saves. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about human dignity, concepts of good reporting, and the third thing, in evil. And Rochelle's going to talk to you about domestic politics and why sourcing this information is going to be specifically harmful. First, the concept of human dignity. We think, in relation to from the victim's perspective, the government has a mandate to protect both the victim's memory, the victim's humanity, and the fact that the moment you were the humanity of a victim, you were the humanity of every other person in existence. Their humanity is not bound up in themselves. The fact that we abhor it is the fact that we recognise they are human. We want to be protected from the fact that arose that ability. Secondly, in relation to the gratuity in media reporting, think not all news outlets are as altruistic and fantastic as first proposition might like you to believe. We think some of them will try for the most gratuitous images, some of them will try for the ones which I'll take you in a moment, lead them towards the most horrific reporting purely for the point of media sales, as opposed to propagating some fantastic notion of information in relation to people's I mean, at the point where horrific images is what sells newspapers, or horrific images is what drives up news, I mean, that's the thing which could be reported at the expense of proper information and at the expense of proper reporting. Uh, given that there are such strong international norms against atrocities, so strong indeed that often we intervene to prevent them. I don't understand why increasing publicity of them would ever make people more likely to engage in them. Okay, what we're saying is, if you want to show a mass slaughter of people, which is what you were allowed to do on this side in relation to the African Civil War, you would say, firstly, the people who are being slaughtered in that, you have a duty in relation to their humanity to protect them from being like, basically watched by the world at the point where they meet their horrific end. And two, you have a duty to protect your people, as we shall talk about later on, from basically being passed on and watch that mutilation take place. Because think at the point where the government prevents missiles from hitting your country during the war, because that prevent hurts you physically, I mean, they should also prevent the mental anguish which war can bring upon you by the same behest. No, fact. We also think at the point where people see more of this day in, day out, it becomes more difficult for them to ever comprehend when something horrific and horrific happens. At the point where they are so used to seeing every corpse, every body, every burning piece of flesh, the next time something horrific happens which you want to garner extra support behind, it is that much more difficult because they are now so used to it that they can't comprehend. Secondly, moving on to the purposes of good reporting. The point is, you can never properly get across the horror of war to 100% degree, regardless of what you show people. The point here is relevance by exclusion. You can get across the point of something that's horrific, no thank you, by pointing out certain images and certain facts and leaving people to think, hmm, this is what they're reporting. Obviously there's some stuff they can't show me. God, must it be awful? What aren't they showing me? The point is, when they can see every single facile aspect of it, there is no spectrum or scope as to what they cannot see. There is nothing left to the imagination to make them think it might be even worse than that. I mean, the point is, you always want people to think wars a little bit worse than they see at the point where you want them to have their conscience in check. At the moment you put it all on the table, that disappears because they're like, okay, well it's horrible, but now I'm seeing all of it. And worse again, if they decide that they're not a poor by what they see, you are validating the concept of the government using tactics which might destroy civilians, the civilians see it and aren't a poor by it. I think that's also a risk you don't specifically want to run. No, thank you. And finally, the concept of validation of pure evil. When if someone's idea of how to propagate a war is the erosion of human life, the erosion of human dignity, when well, you placing that on a grander stage is a validation to that person's actions to a degree. Two, it encourages them to do even more horrific things at the point where they can gain glorification for their cause. They might know the horrific you're going to lose the war, but they don't care if they can show the horror of 
of the destruction of a people, whether it be like any specific national group which is trying to be eradicated previously, they, they don't really care if they win the war, they just want to destroy another people. And the more they can destroy another people and get it on CNN, I think that's exactly the kind of thing which they'll want to do. And CNN will be forced to report it at the point where I've already told you there are certain media aspects who will always cover it, so now you're guaranteed the market will burn itself. I mean, the point is they will actually have to fix this. And finally, the concept of the, concept of the idea of the propagation of horror. When this allows you, as a horrible civil war maniac, or wherever you might be, to propagate your horror, propagate your destruction onto the minds of unwilling participants. It allows you to not just slaughter that person with a burning stick in that country, but burn that image into the mind's eye of every single person who does it. That is something which those people may never be able to get rid of, and if someone said they were going to do that to you in domestic society, the government would have no problem stepping in and preventing it. We don't see just because it's on CNN that you're given the right to do so. So what have we told you? We've told you why specifically human dignity is eroded under this model. We've told you why the concept of good reporting are actively harmed when the point of the story is lost and it's more about the burning flesh. And thirdly, in relation to the validation of pure evil, this is not something which either the media should be involved in or the government should be allowing to happen. We are very proud for those School of Economics and from Ireland to oppose. Violence of Saddam Hussein and is less likely to go over. It seems 
the violence in Rwanda and it sees an outrage on the conscience of the world. It sees the violence in Iraq and it sees an outrage on the conscience of the United States. We think very clearly that the public is able to distinguish between just wars, wars of necessity and wars of choice. That is the distinction. So we think that what we are doing will make just wars more likely and unjust wars less likely. Because we do have empathy for the people of Rwanda. We do or would have empathy with the people of Darfur if we could see what was being done to them. And we would not ourselves choose to start conflicts in which that kind of thing would be done to innocent people for no real reason. So. This leads on to the second point, the responsibility of living in a democratic society. We think, Mr. Speaker, that certainly, in some cases, it is just and even necessary for us to send our troops abroad to fight on our behalf. But we have no right to send our soldiers to fight and kill on our behalf if we are not willing to be aware of what they are doing, if we are not willing to see the cost that they are imposing, both in terms of moral costs, in terms of human costs, on themselves and on the populations where they are fighting. We have no right to do that. We think it's unfair to our troops, it's unfair to the civilians who are being harmed, and it is unfair to our citizens and to our responsibilities as people living in a democratic society. It's also unfair to our process because it makes our process less able to start war, less able to deal with war, less able to resist the pressure to go to war when people don't understand it. But it's also the responsibility of the media to show us these things because the role of the media in a democratic society is not to sing us lullabies and tell us everything is okay when it's not. It's to show us the truth and to allow us to make decisions on the basis of that truth. It is not the media's job to say that you cannot handle certain truths, that you are not capable of processing the full horrors of war. We think the concept of democracy necessarily implies that citizens are able to make different, difficult decisions. If that's not the case, then you have no faith in democracy. Sir. Which is it? People's reaction to violence is always visceral or it leads into an in-depth discussion of just war theory? <laughs> I think the visceral, visceral reaction when we show what's going on in Darfur will necessarily lead us to realize that intervention in there may very well be just. We think, on the other hand, we are angry we have the same POI twice, but when we see what's happening in Iraq, we will be less likely to think that that's just war because the ends of the war are different. In one case, we're preventing atrocities, in the other, we're fomenting them. That's not a very difficult distinction. Finally, what we get from the role of the media from art is the idea that the public somehow will assume that what the media doesn't report on is just so horrific and that they will somehow be able to grasp the horror of war by it being excluded from their view and systematically kept away from the discourse. This is absurd, Mr. Speaker. There's a reason that soldiers and not civilians get post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's that soldiers see the full horror of war. If we want to be able to make these decisions, and we must be able to make these decisions, because war is sometimes just, and war is sometimes necessary, then we need to be able to live with the full cost of that. We need to be able to make those decisions with the full deliberation and the full consciousness of what exactly it is that we are doing. Otherwise, we are moral monsters in Imposing our whims on the rest of the world. Art told you that we are going to be crippling the military by the whims of the public. This is exactly the opposite. We will be crippling the military, we won't be crippling the military, we will be directing the military with a moral goal, with the full heart of war in mind, and that is the only way that we have any right to do so. We are incredibly proud to propose.
Ladies and gentlemen, I've got three points of rebuttal before I show you how this actually hurts the war effort and how it makes us lose wars, not engage in the wars, or just pull out early and disappoint everybody involved. All right, so first thing. Interesting tension here we get. We get JLM's POI, which is, you know what, there are huge historical atrocities being carried out throughout the world. Why not publicize it? Now, presumably he's not publicizing it because he's sadistic. Presumably he wants to publicize it to get more international support and international intervention and actually get people to send troops to do things. Which is in slight tension with Adam's case, which is that we're going to scare civilians and make them think more deeply before actually sending troops anywhere and make sure that they know and feel morally responsible for every single soldier kills. Which one is it and why? Make sure you can tell us that before I'm done with my speech. Right, so that's the first one I'm interested in. Secondly, let's look at the response to human dignity that we got, right? Because he only responded really with this one thing soldiers are special. Fine, maybe soldiers are special. But what about the mothers, sons, doctors, wives, and every other civilian that we show killed in war atrocities in all of these places? Because these are the people killed as collateral damage, and these are the people killed in terrorist attacks, and these are the people that we are talking about most often. Address that. And thirdly, he said that politicians and all of them don't have experience in the line of fire, and so they need their opinion to be counterweighted by the media. We have two responses for this. Firstly, we say it can be a good thing. Because you know what? They're not biased towards or against the war. The public can decide, ladies and gentlemen, what kind of politician they want to vote for, and at that point, the people who cast their vote rationally decide for what kind of leader they want. One who's experienced in the line of fire, or one who isn't. This may be why Obama was elected over McCain. McCain has experience of war, and maybe he's biased or biased against it. At the point where we allow the media to come in and tell people what to think, we take away, ladies and gentlemen, the public's ability to rationally decide what kind of leader they want. And secondly, it's really weird that you bring up the example of General Stanley McChrystal, because he's the exact counterweight that you need to Obama having the experience. We see the generals exist in the status quo, and these are the people that can counterweight the, the president's lack of experience with their actual lack of experience in the line of fire. So we say that doesn't stand, you don't need the media to do it. But you know what? Say art was an idiot, right? Say we accept your yardstick, right? That people's lie, right to dignity is subservient for the war effort working. I'm going to talk about how this policy actually hurts the war effort. Because you flagged it up, but you never talked about it, right? I'm going to talk about A, the political harms that it actually causes, and secondly, the harms in military efficacy that it directly causes. This is a counter direct rebuttal to your we have to have a responsibility to our troops. So what are the political harms it causes? We see that when a population consents to war, they do so on an a priori rational basis, right? When they can rationally weigh up all of the costs and benefits of war and do a rational cost-benefit analysis. We see this policy necessarily exposes viewers to something more than pure information, right? Which we see you can perfectly rationally process. We see it, it makes individuals process information on a subconscious level that rationally that appeals irrationally to their emotive sides by virtue of it, right? We don't ban people from reporting on things like torture, we just ban people from appealing to their subcortex or going via the normal rational mechanisms. We see this is usually a problematic, right? We see there's bad enough oppression in most wars to bring the troops home, even with the normal stories. We see at the point where you take it to a person's irrational point and make them feel morally responsible for every single death in full color HD, we see you severely and instantaneously reduce support for the war at home, ladies and gentlemen, and we see this is hugely problematic. Right? Like, where does it put us in line with this? Because we essentially think it's a paternalistic policy. People have decided what they want, and they've decided what they've wanted with full rational interests. And then they're appealing to their emotive side and bullying them into making them feel responsible. How does this compare us with proposition? Right? What I've told you is that critical thinking about rational weighing up of costs and benefits happens a priori, right? We see the story is still there. But what we see is they do is they bias the negative view, right? Because firstly, it's impossible to demonstrate the massive benefits of war, right? You can't show every single individual saved with the same emotive force that you can show them in the right? political stuff, you make it too easy for the opposition. You make it too easy for them to appeal to the rhetoric of people dying instead of looking at the possibility of lives being saved, right? You see, that's the difficult fact. Secondly, you dropped all of Art's analysis because what you want is a balanced view. But Art gave you a solid three minutes of analysis on why this leads to a race to the most graphic images and ruins news broadcasting as a whole. Because we can see in the state 
this quote, the obsession with negative news reporting, but you've never told us why there's going to be an incentive for a balanced news report. At the point where all of the political discourse is dominated by this, tell me how we're going to get actual public support for an intervention, just or otherwise, ladies and gentlemen. You haven't responded to that, and that's truly problematic. Thank you for the applause. Are there other examples of where in a democracy citizens should have information kept from them, or is it just this one? Yeah, we are giving you examples all the time of how people have information kept from them, like the face of the person that was murdered during like a rape, right? You see, it's not information, and by the way, this is a huge distinction, right? It's not the raw information that they've got a problem with. We're fine with them reporting stories of torture. It's not the information we're talking about. It's the presentation of the information being appealed to these people in a way that makes them rational. Right? At the point you say you should do this, right? images or data need to be collected from somewhere. What are your options if you're a journalist and you're after this? Firstly, the media companies do it solo. We say this is problematic because they become huge targets, right? Because you've got to be in the heat of battle. You've got to be in the freshest war zone to actually try and collect this. And this is more so than normal journalism because these images have to be taken quote unquote fresh. You make them huge targets. You give an active incentive to media companies that wasn't there before to put themselves in harm's way. We think this is usually problematic given that they can be taken hostage and hurt the war effort. But secondly, we say that now we give them a right to be embedded in forward operating units. And we see this as usually problematic because it reduces the efficacy of those forward operating units, right? Not only are these units carrying useless body weight, but we see it makes every single soldier think twice about like, pulling that trigger in front of that camera. It makes every single soldier think twice about obeying what would otherwise be normal orders when they know the entire world is watching. At that point, you severely hurt the war effort. You severely not only hurt every single soldier that exists, but any single soldier that may in the future choose to actually embark upon that job. You hurt the conscripts, not us, ladies and gentlemen. And you hurt those countries when we all pull out halfway through just because we lost the resolve because you appealed to our motive instead of our rational side. So what have we told you? We've told you, firstly, that human dignity should trump all. Even if all your analysis stands, you say that people have an intrinsic right to dignity that doesn't mean that they can be used as social battling rams. But secondly, we say even if we concede all of your analysis, you hurt the war effort and you hurt the truce. We beg to oppose. Well, they were 
what does this first over a battle feel? Means that variety, we get a variety of stories because if you send your reporters all to the same place, you all get the scoop at the same time, and you don't get good press. So it's not at all clear that the point is true in the first place. Sorry. Then Art said no, this will encourage more atrocities due to publicity, resting on the incredibly false assumption that people commit atrocities because they want to be rock stars, right? Because they want to be on the international news. No. Generally, when people commit the worst wartime atrocities, they want to cover it up. That's why the mass graves in Cambodia were hidden rather than put together the thing called the big mountains on top. It makes us more aware of these atrocities. It will make being publicly known for having committed them dangerous. No, thank you, because you'll be more likely to be caught and prosecuted because public opinion may well demand that. So, what do I want to bring you in my case? Sorry, we'll deal with the rest of what they have to say. No. We put to you that not only will this prevent some of the worst forms of atrocities, but also improve our ability to hold our governments to account. And this will deal with most of what Rishabh had to say, right? We put to you that the ability of governments to do the most unethical things in war rests their ability to hide in a their belief, what they do behind the old words. Yes. Is it not hugely offensive to Muslims to show their dead loved ones on TV and in doing no, so like CNN make I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Your right to be offended is somewhat, your right not to be offended is somewhat smaller than the right of the world to know that a genocide has happened and to know it in a visual way that will prevent further genocide. <laughs> Wartime atrocities happen behind the veil of euphemism, right? Pacification means machine gunning villagers to drive them out of the area. Collateral damage means people torn to pieces, limbs blown apart because of your bombs. Intensive interrogation means Sir. torture. No, thank you. No matter what the American government would like us to believe me, but we can't show that to the world until we show it on TV. That's why CNN decided to show what it was like to have Christopher Hitchens, Walter Walton, massively changed American public opinion on whether or not water body was water. The man that all of words so that our moral sentiments can see the truth. Furthermore, we put to you that this is not saying, well, no, you know, you were, we, we think it's really bad for journalists to be in harm's way, to be deep in war zones. It's good for journalists to be in harm's way because only when they are in harm's way can they catch the atrocities happening. And yes, some of them will be captured. Yes, that would be regrettable. We might have to have a policy that means we think these are part of the harms of the job, and if you're really, really captured and you'll be tortured and killed, we might not be able to save you, right? That's perfectly possible, and this isn't necessarily a big impediment, but thank you, to the military machine. But having journalists in harm's way is just part of good journalism, because how else are they going to find these atrocities? What? Like, by telepathy? No. Furthermore, we put to you that there is a principal case, right, that we want to make that this sort of image is necessary for us to make accountable and genuine moral decisions in a democracy. Because we put to you that you don't make a once and for all choice whether or not to go to war, right? There's no a priori rational basis to quote Rashad about whether or not we should go into war. You go into war and you have an experience of what it's like. No, thank you. New images and new statistics come up to you. Situations change. You reassess your preferences. There is no once and for all decision. No, thank you. And in order for you to reassess your preferences, you need the kinds of things to be able to make these decisions. And they may say, but, but you've got a right to protect your society, right, from existential threats. So, like, you can sense these images to make us any kind of fighting wars. Firstly, whether or not a war is an existential threat is itself up to public debate. And that public debate may well, no thank you, be informed by images. But furthermore, even if there is an existential threat, we put to you very often it's up to the public to decide whether or not, you know, some risk to its existence is worth the price of, say, I don't know, you should chemical weapons to make sure that there's no threat, right? So, don't think, no thank you, that say, this might cause you not to wage some wars that automatically wins their side of the case. But we put to you that the best moral decisions aren't dispassionate. We Trump said the media will tell you what to think by showing you an image. No analysis at all as to why this forces you to think in a particular way. It might make you change your mind. But typically, the media changing your mind about the thing, no thank you, is a good thing in the democratic society. It's part of the deliberative process. But the best moral decisions aren't dispassionate because we can't get sort of a priori rational ground on which to intervene in genocide, right? We intervene in genocide even if we can't construct a purely rational reason as to why we should do so. Because ultimately, much of our morality is grounded in our common humanity. It's grounded in that feeling in our breast that says, there's another human being hurt and I need to save them now. And that Seeing the gas chambers, touching the walls, makes you understand the experience in a special way. That's why we think the survivors generally of, say, genocide and, you know, all kinds of racial appetite have a special story to tell. Because there is a part of their story that transcends the mere facts. A part of the story that humanizes them for you. 
or your duty, making good moral decisions isn't just about having a list of facts before you in a spreadsheet. It's about your ability to see past those facts to the human being. And that was the activation of your moral sentiments, the activation of that inner conscience which leads you to defend humanity. And it's that activation which we propose. So what do we show you today? Firstly, this will lead to better coverage of atrocities, fewer atrocities, better accountability, and in principle, it will lead us to see the common humanity that will lead to fewer deaths and fewer tortures in the world. We're very proud to propose. Thank you. 
comes to improving the conduct of wars, the closing government's extension. One, we're not against any reporting of atrocities. Two, we think there's massive safeguards that already exist to prevent atrocities happening, like the fact soldiers are not barbarians, the fact that in the militaries have accountability regimes. Third, the fact that it is against the law to break the rules of war. But we don't need a graphic image to necessarily improve that process of accountability. So, why does this stop democracies fighting against war? The opening opposition have already talked about the public bias against violence. But we would say further that it's already difficult for democracies to fight good wars in two main ways. One, publics can't, can't actually appreciate the strategic calculus of why a war needs to be fought. And two, they can't necessarily appreciate the utilitarian calculus that justifies that war. So we think it is, in principle, perfectly legitimate for governments to withhold information in order to preserve the public will towards war, given that the public is structurally incapable of appreciating the reason why that war needs to be fought and the consequences of what that war. Like FDR systematically lied to the American people for the late 30s and early 40s about US support for the arms builder in Western Europe, like by, by giving sort of uh, lots of military backing to the Allies against Hitler. Now, if the, if the public find out about, found out about that, it would never have happened. So, let me get this straight. You're now saying that we'd have better public policy if citizens were kept uninformed so that politicians could do what they please. <laughs> It is perfectly legitimate for governments to control the types of information and the access of information that is distributed to the public because it makes it a prior commitment to fight a war. But the we say like there's like an interesting problem here. But once one, what happens is there's like a false equivalence on the basis of image. So the public thinks that their war is just as morally integral as the enemy's war because all they're seeing is the enemy is the casualties. We think that leads to basic risk aversion where the public can't process probabilities. So take the example of Somalia and Rwanda. We think that when the American public saw soldiers being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu, that meant that they had no goodwill to then go into go into Rwanda. Because we think they didn't know it was really being terrible war. The final thing we say is that why it stops democracies fighting wars is that when we empower enemy propaganda with the images that in, in this case will be presented without the necessary context and be presented in very slanted ways, the credibility of our salt power is inevitably damaged. So two, why does this undermine our capacity to prosecute wars? Everyone acknowledges that some wars are worth fighting. We say one, the problem with this policy is it necessarily emboldens the enemy. Because once you release the information, you lose control of the message and these images will be interpreted in particular ways against our strategic interests. Two, it hurts operational flexibility. Like these guys are too far in a mythical distinction between what is strategic and important and what is not. Like it is not in the interest to have reporters embedded with every army unit on the front lines, every field hospitals, just because they're like roving a human rights atrocities reporters. The third thing we say is there's enormous unintended effects. One, in terms of like risk averse tactics that will be pursued by militaries because they don't want civilian, they don't want their soldiers to actually die and they don't want sort of like very graphic casualties, so it's more drones and things like that. It also means more proxy forces, because they don't want to use their own forces to control other people. It's necessarily like harms accountability if that's what they're on about, and also undermines the credibility of that war. Mr. Speaker, because this undermines our capacity to fight good wars, and does so in a manner which undermines our capacity to wage war, we proudly oppose. Will it improve the practice of people on the battlefield? Well, I've had 
a major reason for believing that this would be not true, okay? Which is the idea will encourage worse atrocities by the people who want to see people commit, who want people to see them commit mass slaughter. Now, that seems fairly clearly wrong because as Shane pointed out, the premise is wrong. People don't commit mass slaughter because they want it to be seen. They commit it in the blind spots in the world where they can get away with it in the vast majority of cases. We say that, that is because for two reasons that Shane pointed out. One, because there are very strong international norms of disapproval that surround such acts. Even if you think it's a really good idea and you believe it's justified, you're very unlikely to be willing to publicise the fact you've done it in a world which says that you are a war criminal, may at some stage be prosecuted if you want to it, by the way, and may have an intervention launched against you to prevent you doing it. We say that at the very least these people ought to be risk averse and not do things for, uh, that will likely to bring an intervention. I think that's very, very important. So we also say that e even if it were true that there were some people who will do this, it is far more important that we stop the far vast majority of people who commit these acts because they lack any oxygen of publicity, because they're able to get away with it because nobody will see what they're doing. Those numbers far out outweigh in any cases that they can look forwards. So then we say, will it be therefore no thank you to better practice itself? We said there are several reasons why we suspect that it will, no fact. We say, first of all, it closes, as Shaker put it, the dehumanisation and distance gaps, okay? A lot of terrible things happen in the world because statistics and detached reporting can't get people to understand the full reality, no fact, of what is going on. Now, I got very confused and labelled this a contradiction. Is it going to be rational, they said, or is it going to be emotional? That is a false dichotomy, Mr. Speaker. of what is actually going on in the world. When people who nearly hear 50,000 dead, they never, ever really understand that that would mean lining up every single one of their friends in a room, multiplying the number by 10, and killing all of them. We say no thank you, that is a gap. We have to vote to be able to make that decision. It's not, as, 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 as Second Law clearly wanted to put it, about, like, oh, they're going to go up and use grocers. No, we don't think they're going to get a degree in international law and human rights. We think they're going to be able to see but what this means is that vast numbers of people are dying, and that's probably not okay. No thank you. Didn't get any response when Chamber said that either way. We also say no thanks that it will create better practice because of the fact of simple revelation, okay? Because we're reducing censorship on journalism, in fact. No thank you. We're increasing the freedom of journalists to spot these things happening. So it's not just about when things happen elsewhere by other people, it's about the very practices that our soldiers, when they go into a country in our name, in the name of our security, no thanks, engage in. We also say it's more likely to create more invested to journalists. This was said to be a problem because journalists will now get themselves caught hostage all the time. We say, uh, Mr. Speaker, that that is a risk that they should be able to undertake if they want to. If they want to go in, into places and try and undertake the risks that are required in order to reveal the most, what, the worst form of atrocity in human history, we think that is a right and heroic duty that they should be able to engage in if they want to. We also it will create less jingoism, okay? Look at World War One, the example these guys tried to bring up. The central reason why World War One was one of the greatest disasters in human history is because people had no concept of what war really meant. We need better to help No, thank you. We also said in Chengdu's speech, and this is particularly important in the modern age, right, that it will encourage less euphemism. Because governments have got much cleverer at enabling us to get support for their wars. They disguise their real practices behind other words, like, you know, Sorry. intensive, no thanks, interrogation, and things like that. They, they talk about, like, collateral damage, rather than vast numbers of civilians being bombed and killed by our weapons in our name. We say this massively undermines that ability. It undermines the ability for governments to spin the agenda against reality and against the interests of people. We think that's a good thing. Go ahead. Given that Michelle told you it's impossible to put across the positive results while you're saving lives in the same way as you ever put the bad stuff across, isn't it important to attend our balanced new? Yeah, I think that's impossible. Yeah, I, I understand. I think that is impossible in a world where the government controls the debate. But we say that not only that, this actually undermines the people on the other side that you're concerned about as well. Because it's also harder for those who are extremely opposed to wars or want to denigrate the military to do it when people have faith that their government and the media is going to actually tell them the truth. It's very important. A key result of our policy that undermines that argument is that people now believe that they are seeing the full story. You increase trust in the media. We think that's important. So also about the principle of empowering responsibility. Fundamentally here there is a right, okay? A right to hold our government accountable and to do that, no thanks, we need to be able to know what is actually going on. That is particularly in an environment where the most dangerous kind of actions ever go on, okay? It's particularly important here. 
particularly important not only in a thank you because we need to be able to see the consequences of our government's policy to ever truly hold it to account, but also because we need to be able to police the actions of our soldiers and our generals because in the vast majority of cases no one else will. This is not because of an assertion that all generals are really bloodthirsty and that, you know, they're not all heroes. We say, yeah, even if they are heroes, they're also fallible, they also make wrong decisions and they're less likely to do it if we hold them to account. And at least let's work out who's who. Let's find who the good generals are and work out who the bad ones are and create a more informed public. Then again, Ott said that this is a contradiction. Are we going to go in more often or less often? This is simplistic. It is not the problem that the moment there's too much war in total or too little war in total, but that as Shannon put it, the public are really bad at distinguishing poorly. They're really bad at distinguishing well, okay? This empowers the public. It means that we can see when it's just and see when it's not, rather than only being able to follow the spin that our governments labour at us. We say, even if that means we do occasionally withdraw in situations that opt might be what they say are wrong, opt might be wrong, okay? You should leave it to the public to decide because the public are ultimately better in power to make this than a small group of politicians. We say that is fair. So also they said human dignity. They gave us, and this is important that Shaker pointed out, no compelling comparative analysis, okay? No reason why, even if we did want to protect human dignity, it was more important than preventing atrocities happening and the abuse of human rights around the, uh, around the world. We also pointed out in Shaker's speech that this may well be, and there's a strong reason to believe, what the dead would want, okay? A strong reason to believe this is exactly the kind of thing that they would value. Finally, we heard that this, you know, will reduce our security and it's a strategic, uh, a strategically poor idea. The oldest and most dangerous excuse for cover-ups in the book. Security, as Shaker pointed out, is not a trump card. Citizens should decide for themselves what they are willing to sacrifice their security rather than being told by their government that it's important to bomb people around the world and use chemical weapons because security has to be a prima facie imperative. We say there's no reason to think that is true. Citizens ought to be able to decide and we empower them. We're proud to propose. was dragged through the streets for everyone to see on TV. And Bill Clinton was forced to leave Somalia and let the country burn. He was forced to not go into Rwanda and let people die in their hundreds of thousands. That's the gap between learning with empathy about, about conflict and seeing the visceral reaction of the brutality. That's the leads to a situation where people lose the ability to make fair utilitarian calculuses. That's where you lead to a situation where instead of people empathising with the horrors that they hear and that they see it out, the people instead are overridden by a visceral reaction. People are led into the trap of privileging one American life over the lives of the thousands and millions of Somalians who died in 1992 and have been dying for 17 years since. Mr. Speaker, I'll ask two questions. Firstly, how do we enter war? Secondly, how do we fight war? To the first, no thank you. We heard from the closing government that it's necessary to have full and proper information to make a proper decision. They said that euphemisms are a problem. We say firstly, if you don't like euphemisms, that's an example of good, uh, uh, an argument for good journalism that doesn't use them. But secondly, that is an argument for the media to not report government spin verbatim, not an argument to show graphic control. Secondly, we have to show the government deliberately, I assume, misleading language when he said, you can never understand when you look at spreadsheets. I don't know when the last time he read the report of the Iraq war was, but I didn't see any freaking spreadsheets attached to it. What I saw was the use of the English language to convey what occurs in wars and to convey what goes on in wars, but not graphic pictures that can help you. Not empathy with the people that see those graphic pictures, but a visceral reaction that overrides their rationality, that makes them force their leaders to do things that condemns other people to death because of their natural reaction to privilege their brother or their sister or their mother or their father over hundreds of thousands of other people. And that's what we told you in the extension at closing opposition. We heard it open that a visceral reaction will lead to more just war. We say firstly that mistakes what a visceral reaction does. But it was also simply an assertion 
to say that if people had seen viscerally the true horror of Rwanda, we would have gone in. But at the same time, if we saw viscerally the true horror of fighting to free the Iraqi people, we wouldn't have gone in. The relevant comparison is whether if we saw the visceral, the visceral result of fighting to free the Rwandan people. Because by their very logic, when we saw a war in Central Africa that was killing white people, we would have pulled our troops out and never gone into that war. That was the problem with the response to our POIs, even though we tried twice to get the idea out, them, out there for them to grapple with it. Show me, Johnny, whoever. Okay. You can't just assert the right cases and the wrong cases because neither you nor governments are omniscient. Why can't citizens make these decisions and why should they be able to decide upon seeing gruesome images that it's simply not worth it to fight a war in their name with these costs? Because we told you that there is a distinction between empathy and a visceral reaction. We told you that dreaming about 100,000 people dying in Darfur lets you empathise with what it must be like to see the Janjaweed ride into the place on the back of a camel armed with an AK-47. I've never seen the photo of them doing it, but I've read about it and I know. But by the same token, seeing someone who lived down the street from me in Connecticut, disemboweled and hanging for a bridge in Fallujah, will make me think all of a sudden that my government shouldn't be in there because of that very deep and visceral reaction. That's why this leads to bad wars. To the first question, to the second question, how do we fight the war? We heard that we need to not worry about families. They ignore two things. Firstly, that's just taking the choice away from them and giving them to the government. But secondly, often the families aren't even within our cultural realm. So when Iraqi people see the destruction of their country as hugely offensive and the projection of images of their dead fellows as hugely shameful and offensive, then the government deciding to appease Western tastes by broadcasting them is hugely offensive to the victims of Western wars and builds propaganda. So effectively, CNN is now the producer or the main producer of Al Qaeda's propaganda. We set that up for some good hearts and minds within those two minutes. No thank you. We know that tactics become more moderate and proportional, and that the example is Israel. <laughs> so, you know, the war in Gaza in 2009, yeah. But we also, say, we also say that one of the things, and we're talking about this extension, what governments do, and it is necessarily realise that people will have a bigger visceral reaction to seeing one of their own troops there than to seeing the opposition there. So they'll be more likely to use tactics that kill the opposition and are more indiscriminate about killing the opposition if they can save their people on the ground. That is all the proposition factor, Mr. Speaker. That is why the United States moved from putting troops in the ground, from running the risk of a black hole being down, and instead use predator drones to attack things that may or may not have been done. We heard that the United States won't commit atrocities again. Odd that the examples we heard, like my line, like the torture of Guantanamo, like extraordinary ambition, were all ended by our existing accountability processes. Because the thing the opposition forgot is that Barack Obama and the, the US House of Representatives Intelligence Committee don't get their reporting from CNN. They have access to the graphic content. They can see it. They can weigh it up. And they make the decision, no thank you. They make the decision and they hold the people accountable. So we're not saying that we should censor the report into a torture that occurred over and above what should have happened. We're not saying we sent to the report provided to military intelligence about a potential massacre by saying we don't release the report to the public. And that's why Barack Obama has been able to stop extraordinary rendition and stop torturing people at Guantanamo without releasing videos of people doing it. To say that this impeachment, who was like grandstanding by getting himself waterboarded, somehow taught us something was silly. He was like doing this after the tide had obviously turned, after Barack Obama had turned back the policy, and when we all already knew what what waterboarding did and what waterboarding hurt people. But we also told you this in extension, that when there are going to be wars and conflicts, if we don't fight, the conflict doesn't cease to exist. If we didn't go into Rwanda, it didn't mean that conflict didn't occur. If we can't fight the war in Iraq the way that we want to, it doesn't mean that conflict will occur, it means that conflict will be passed to actors that are less likely to be accountable under this policy. So America will use more mercenaries. America will choose to arm brutal warlords in Afghanistan instead of fighting the war there itself. Because this policy will cripple the ability of its citizens to support the war and support necessary tactics. So Mr Speaker, there is a distinction between empathising by reading about what happens in a war and knowing about what happens in a war, and having the visceral reaction that people have to seeing their loved ones brutalised, broadcast across the world, and in doing so, stopping us from fighting wars well, stopping us from fighting wars when we need to, and ultimately leading utilitarianly to more people dying in worse ways. 